Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm hoping my voice will last for the hour and 15 that we're going to spend together. And the good thing when you don't have a very big group is that I, we can really have uh, more of a conversation. And so when you have, a, when you have a, a much bigger group, it becomes less personal. So smaller groups allow for personal a little bit more of a personal approach. This is a very um, challenging uh, topic. Um, I would say working fraternally anywhere, right, is um, uh, uh, a bit of a challenge. But working fraternally at the Spiritual Center is no different. Sometimes people come to the Spiritual Center and they think that because we're working with uh, the spiritists that, you know, everybody's going to be so nice and it's going to be so much easier and that's just a very uh, big illusion, right? The work is just as hard as um, anywhere else. So the material that um, you have there, for you guys who are right, there's a handout here. Um, please pick it up because um, it's going to be, the, the idea is that it's going to be interactive. We're going to do some exercises throughout. Um, and so everybody should have it, should have a pen on your hands as well. Um, for writing, okay? Um, you can um, ask me questions at any time. Um, no problem. And I have a collection of um, material from uh, the books that you have on the um, cover that unfortunately are not translated to English. So all the translation that you're going to see was done by me. At the very end of the handout, it says that um, even though I put my best effort into it, I'm sure that's not perfect. So if you want to go back to the references and, and improve the translation or change the material in any way that you can, please do so. If you want to have the material in uh, uh, PDF or, or, you know, to take to your centers, and, and please let me know. Send me an email and I will um, provide you with the material, okay? So let's start by <clears throat> um, with some directives by the spirit Bezerra de Menezes where he speaks about the mission of uh, spiritism. And so he says that spiritism has the extraordinary mission of humanizing modern society, bringing Jesus back so that men and women can definitely understand the meaning of love and its natural consequences, fraternity, respect of other, and respect of the right of all beings. So I am um, a professor as well, and the way that I usually study is when I read something, I really try to understand the meaning of each word in the text. Sometimes we read, we read, we'd read this paragraph and we would think, oh, I understand what, what the Dr. Bezerra de Menezes is saying. You know, do you really understand it? So the point is, okay, spiritual has a mission, which is humanize modern society. What humanizing modern society means? What humanizing means? Anyone? If you have to say, you know, in one sentence, what comes to your mind when you think about humanizing society? Getting to feel more. Feel more? Feelings. 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 More feelings. Okay, good. Love. Were you going to say something different? Yeah. Get huh? Get together. Get together. Yeah. Work together. Work together. Okay, so feelings, working together. Love each other. Huh? Loving each other. Okay, you guys are good. You're in the right uh, path. Um, the topic speaks about, um, you know, uh, working fraternally at the Spiritual Center, but I want to think about it working fraternally anywhere. Because if the mission of Spiritism is to humanize society, we have a huge mission in our hands. We need to learn how to work fraternally at the Spiritual Center in the spiritist movement, in the international spiritist movement, if you want to really reach the mission, the goal established by Dr. Bezerra de Menezes, which is the humanization of society, okay? So it's not the Brazilian society, it's the global society, right? So 
we're going to be, so I will be talking about, um, again, uh, the spiritual center, but the spiritual movement at different levels, okay? So what does the idea of humanization involve? And I thought, um, to go back to the spirits book, and in there, the spirits tell along Kardec that human beings possess a special and unlimited intelligence which provides them with awareness of their future, the perception of extra material things, and the knowledge of God. In this answer, the spirits are differentiating what makes humans different uh, between humans and animals and the other kingdoms of nature. So the spirits are telling along Kardec that we have awareness. We have awareness of the future and that has more implications to the present, right? Um, we know that the material reality is not the only reality and we have knowledge of God and that's highlighted in red. Why? Because what are the implications of knowing God to our lives? So I stated there, we all have a common source of origin, our origin is love. We are all equal and divine under God. No one loves God without loving God's creatures. And we will learn to love God in loving one another. We all know these things, right? But let's stop for one second, okay? If I would ask you, do you love God? Your answer is? Yes. yes. Everybody loves God? Really? Are you sure? We love God in some level, the level that we can love God. But to come to truly love God, to love God wholly and fully, we must love every single creature of God because in you I see God, in you I see God. If we aren't able to see God in someone else, we have yet to learn to love God. So this is the first thing that I want to tell you. I'm just setting the basis for how can we work fraternally, okay? Let's seek this mindset. Let's try this, and I'm going to propose a number of exercises. So write them down and see if you can do them as you live here. Especially the people that you have a difficult time with anywhere. Next time you look at them, you're going to say, I am seeing God in you. Not out loud. <laughs> Right? But you're going to say that. Because when you say within your mind, I'm seeing God in you, at that moment, you two are the same. Okay? Some of the barriers start to, because when we don't like someone, or when we have a difficult time with someone, the first feeling is that you will not like me. So there's an immediate feeling of separation. When I look at someone and say, I see God in you, I see that you are my brother under God, then the barriers start to come down, okay? Now, in the gospel, we re it reads that spiritism, when well understood, but especially when well felt, inevitably leads to the results listed above. It's talking about the moral person, which characterizes the true spiritist as well as the true Christian, for they are one and the same. Okay. Our spiritist movement and our spiritist centers are filled with doctors in spiritism. Anyone, any one of you, I assure you, can come over here, take my place, and do what I'm doing. We can all talk about the philosophy and the theory, the beautiful theory of spiritism. But Dr. Bezerra de Menezes tells us that our mission is to humanize society, and humanize society is precisely to learn to love one another and to bring Jesus back. And so spiritism, in order to accomplish its mission, needs to be felt. Felt. It needs to find a place in our hearts you know when you're reading Paul and Stephen and you start to cry? Anyone has had this experience when you're reading Paul and Stephen and you're like sobbing sometimes in certain parts? Now, that's feeling. You moved. You got to be moved like that every day. You know, it needs to speak to your heart. It can't be just empty words 
that don't get to your heart. So when Jesus says you must love your enemies, you have to feel that. You have to bring within you this message. And it helps if you understand that your enemy is your brother. So that's the beginning. But here's the thing. If we are going to accomplish our mission of humanization of society, we must feel. So a lot of what we're going to do today is about feeling. So summarizing this introduction, I would say that if we want to humanize society, we must feel that our neighbor is our brother. We must understand that we will not come to love God without loving God's creatures. Jesus is the reference for relating, loving all creatures regardless of their sentiment in relation to him. Now, this is a text from um, the book by um, Cesar Braga Said. There is um, a chapter that's called um, uh, Humanize. And so um, I'm going to read it. Humanize, we are in tune with Jesus' proposal that raises us from instinct to reason, from emotions to feelings, developing our hearts, tolerance and solidarity with our brothers and sisters necessary to live in society. Human eyes, we awaken to the need of empathy and compassion, seeking to understand and assist our suffering brothers. Human eyes, we understand the true meaning of the word charity as understood by Jesus, benevolence for all, indulgence with others' imperfections, and forgiveness of offenses. Human eyes, we understand that we cannot be angels without first being humans tolerating one another, accepting others, because we truly need one another in order to grow and to conquer happiness. The true student of spirit is with someone who makes an effort to be fraternal with the one next to him or her. So I just brought this text because it illustrates to us what this humanization process should look like and should feel like. Now, how are we going to humanize society? And so again, it's Dr. Bezerra de Menezes that's going to say, a new spiritist, I invited to the work of edification of the future days through your moral transformation, through your efforts to cooperate with the divine psyche, which reaches you through inspiration and through the stars that drop over earth, personified at the spirits who constitute the group of truth. So this is no news. It's just beautifully said by Dr. Bezerra de Menezes, but we are looking at our moral transformation. I believe that everybody in this room is committed to their own moral transformation. So we're going to start the work part of our um, workshop. And before we start, I want you to, for, for a couple seconds, Okay, I want you to think about maybe one, two, three, maybe many people that you know that you are struggling with lately. Okay, so maybe your mind will be empty because there's no one who you're struggling with lately. Good for you, <laughs> right? But think about it. Think about these persons. If, if there are some in the spiritual center, even better, but it can be anywhere really, okay? So now, what you're gonna do is forget about this person, and I want you, in your mind, to look at you, your face in front of you like if you're looking at the mirror, okay? So this workshop is not about any of these persons. It's about you, because they are not the problem. The problem is how you deal with them because you have no power over them. The only true power that we have is over our own reactions, right? So from now on, I want you to forget any person who causes you trouble and truly, truly focus on yourself. Watch and pray. So when the Bible says to pray and to be vigilant, to be vigilant of your own life and not the life of others. That's, a, that's very difficult, very difficult. We have a very difficult time to see our own. When we are in a conflict, 
All we can see is the mistakes, the illusions, the errors of the other person as if we don't have any. As if there is no chance that we can be possibly off. Right? Right. Okay. So let, since, since, since we all here, most of us, let me see, who, who here has been a spiritist for more than uh, three years? Raise your hand, please. Ah, so everybody should know where is this reference in the codification. The true spirit is recognized by the efforts that he or she makes to overcome his or her bad tendencies. Go ahead and check it on your, on your booklets. Where do you think the... No, I don't want to expose anybody. Just write down on your own books. Okay, Spirit's Book, Gospel, Spirit's Magazine, Genesis. All right, okay, and the answer is in the Gospel according to Spiritism. Oh, man. Okay, now, look back a year or two ago, and since it's all about moral progress, what more progress have you made? And you can just write next to the question, um, yes or no, okay? Are you more in peace with your mind? Are you less involved in personal wars? Do you love more? Are you more compassionate? Are you more forgiving? Are you less self-centered? Are you working more to promote Christ's message than your personal agenda? <laughs> so, so? Okay. All right. So, the, um, is anyone in the room that answered yes to all of them? Oh, come on, you guys are better than that. Yes, thank you. Nobody else? Yes? Oh, right, don't be shy. If you, if, you are, if you are committed to your moral transformation, you should feel that from two years to now, you should be answering yes to all those questions. I'm not asking if you love 100% of the time or you forgive 100% of the time. I'm asking you, if compared to two years ago, do you feel, do you feel that your heart is less hard? Do you feel that you understand people better? Do you feel that you have more empathy for others? Do you feel that you're more compassionate? You're less rigid in your points of view. So, we are growing, right? So we probably answer yes for m most of these questions, hopefully to all of them. But those are questions that maybe each year we should ask ourselves in checking our own uh, progress, our own moral transformation. Now looking within. Now I wanted to take a minute and think about two major triggers with people that disharmonize you. Try to think why they trigger you. And let me give you an example. Um, one of the things that uh, trigger me, my shadow uh, comes out, is when I realize that people are not efficient in what they are doing. At work, for instance, you know, um, I have some coworkers that I don't think much of them. And so sometimes I feel very irritated and I have these, um, you know, they, they, again, they trigger my shadow side, you know. And so this is important that, you know, we understand what is in others that trigger us. This might not be very easy to answer right now, but you have the material, think about it. Because the most important thing when you recognize that is to ask yourself why. Because obviously, it's not their problem. Because that same coworker is going to trigger different responses on somebody else. It's not about he or she not being good at what they do. It's about what is the vulnerability within myself 
that makes me respond, what, why do I get so irritated with this person? And this is what I need to find out, why? Why? Why I have such little tolerance for this type of person? And if I knew the answer, I would share with you, but I'm still working on this area, so I can't really tell you the answer. Now, the other question is, how do you take criticism? And how criticism makes you feel? We are so good in criticizing. It is just so easy to say, you know what, the Seven Spiritual Symposium was so, so. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So far, wonderful. But we are experts in finding problems and in criticizing. Now, think, think for a second, how do you feel when you are criticized? Criticism, most of the times, makes us feel small. We don't like to be criticized because we want to be nothing else but adored. If possible, 100% of the time. So if someone tells you, listen, the symposium was more or less blah, 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 then the person who is listening that is going to listen it this way. You didn't do such a good job. It could have been better. And so what we do is we take it to ourselves our ego feels diminished, and then, as I'm listening to the criticism, my blood is running faster, my heart rate, I enter in a defensive mode for survival. The ego needs to survive in that moment. And so Alirio de Cerqueira Filho has a really good work where he talks about the compensatory mechanisms of the ego, and also Eckhart Tolle, um, in the book A New Earth, has, he, he speaks brilliantly about it. So, let me give you an example. If you are, in the classical example, every uh, lecture I hear this, you're driving and someone cuts you. In that moment, you feel diminished. How does this person dare to get in front of me like this? So you feel so little, so little, the ego needs to do something, a compensatory mechanism of the ego. So what the ego does, rolls the window and shouts. And when the ego rolls the window down and shouts, the ego grows and you no longer feel little. So the lesson here is we are going to feel diminished and the exercise is let it be. Let it be because it's not true that you were little. And if you can stand that feeling, you're going to realize in the next moment that you have actually grown spiritually speaking. So try not to roll down the window. It's an exercise. I, I, sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. Now, how flexible are you in listening to an idea contrary to yours? Again, what do you feel? I have this brilliant idea. I come to the president of the Spiritual Center and I want to propose this wonderful project. And the president says, well, I don't think that this is really the best moment for us to do this. How do you feel? And what do you do with those feelings? Leonardo Boff in Brazil, he says, he who believes to have a hold of the absolute truth will not be able to tolerate another truth and his destiny is intolerance. So, one thing that we must, well, that we should think about is that our, the truth is always relative. If we believe in that, then we're going to have at least a little room because the truth is relative to our belief system, to the ways in which we see things, especially in our level of evolution, okay? So if we think this way, and again, this is an exercise, and the spiritual center is the most perfect place because it's hard to deal with these conflicts outside of the spiritual center. In the spiritual center, at least, you think that the good spirits are there giving you a hand. So you have at least, spiritually speaking, a positive environment on your side and a better chance of succeeding. So take advantage of it when working with different 
uh, brothers and sisters and having a discussion on how are we going to plan the next event. Oh, I think it should be done Sunday at the park. Oh no, it's been so hot, I think it should be done on Saturday night at somebody's house. And then in that moment that someone disagrees with you, you start to dislike that person. You know what I mean? Because someone's thinking differently than you. And at this moment, it takes one to say, this is not about my idea, this is about raising money to the center, let's look what's best for the majority. And sometimes that means giving up on your idea. And that's difficult, but it's necessary. Okay, now, looking a little bit into the obstacles. The biggest enemy of the spiritual society, not outside the society, we can close our ears and doors to them. This is Alain Kardec. The most terrible enemies are the invisible ones that could interfere with the work despite our efforts to keep them out. Our job, as we have done, is to prove to them that, 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 it, that it is a waste of time to attempt to impose themselves on us. Their technique we know well is to sow dissension, to generate disagreements, to inspire jealousy, suspicions, and all the childish vulnerabilities that lead to disaffection. So, in addition to our vulnerabilities and frailties, you have the spirits who are going to tap into them to pull us apart. Very simple. So, if your vulnerability is, you know, because you're very jealous, they're going to tap into that. They're going to nurture that in you, trying to see if you can get into a disagreement with somebody else in the spiritual center. That's their main technique, and this is Kardec speaking 1861. Continues to be the same issue. And in another of his speeches, he says, to arrive at such an end, which is the negative influence of the incarnates, one of their techniques is dissension. They know very well that it is easier to dominate someone who is deprived of support. Thus, when they want to influence someone negatively, their first step is to generate suspiciousness and isolation. So no one can unmask them by providing assistance to the obsessed person with solitary devices. The entire group think one way and I'm thinking differently. And then in the spiritual center, I get more and more isolated from the group. Be careful, be careful. Because when we are isolated in our points of views and in our behavior, that's very, very dangerous. And the person who is isolated is gonna tend to think that the entire group is wrong. And that is, in the medium's book, one of the doors for fascination. Okay, so we must work together in the spiritual center, not isolate ourselves in the spiritual center, not isolate ourselves in the spiritual movement. Because it is precisely this, this touch, this connection, that allows, as difficult as it is, to sometimes have dialogues with our friends from other centers, from you know, anywhere else, and, and, and share ideas, and this grants us protection. So again, whether we're talking about the spiritual movement or we're talking about the spiritual center. Gentlemen, personally, I would enjoy an unthinkable privilege if I was shielded from criticism. We don't expose ourselves without being exposed to the darts of the ones who do not think like us. Alain Kardec, highly, highly, highly criticized. Chico Javier, the same. Jesus Christ, the same. Why do we think that we're not going to be criticized, right? How can we wish not to be criticized? Jesus was perfect, perfect. And he ended up nailed. So we're going to end up where? Nailed, nailed. So, again, we need to understand what criticism does to us, and we need to create the resources 
to overcome it. And we need to understand that that's part of living. You know, it's going to be part of our work. The question is, how are we going to deal with it? <clears throat> and then just finishing this um, more theoretic part, we're going to do some more exercises. Kardec will say, but there are two types of criticism. One is filled with venom, where envy betrays itself in each word. The other one truly seeks to research the truth. They are very different from one another. The first one deserves nothing but disdain. I am never bothered by it. The second one deserves to be analyzed. This is important not only because we receive criticism, but when we are providing criticism, what is behind our words? You know, I wish I could say there is no competition between the Spiritual Center in the United States. I don't know. I think sometimes um, I may look, let me speak about myself. So I look at another, being a president of one Spiritual Center, I may look at another Spiritual Center and say, oh my God, I wish my Spiritual Center had this. You know, and that's okay. And that's okay, you can wish to have something, but, what it, but are you envious? Are you, are you coming from a place where I want to be as good as they, are you feeling diminished because they have something that you don't have? So when we criticize, what is the feeling behind? Okay, that's very important for our analysis. Okay, so now let's, so workshops, not meant to be a lecture, so let me give you a very, um, uh, an example. Okay, Nathan does a lecture using 80% of reference from Buddhist ideas in a public meeting. As the person responsible for the quality of the meeting and speeches, you think that Nathan should use more spiritist references. Should you criticize Nathan or not? Do you feel that it's hard to speak to Nathan about it? Why? What would you say? How would you say it to Nathan? I want to volunteer to speak to Nathan. Anyone? Who would feel comfortable? Raise your hand, please. Nathan is a speaker that came, that just gave you a speech at your center. And you, what's your name? Ana Paula. Ana Paula is responsible for scheduling. Nathan uh, is a speaker of another center. You invited him because someone told you that he's great. So he's coming to your spiritual center to speak, and he just finished the lecture, and you're like, mm -mm -mm. I'm going to change this now. Nathan is a worker of your center. I, I think this is better. And then, yeah, it's better. And then that day he didn't do a very good lecture. And so you're going to approach him, and you're going to say, You wouldn't approach him. Thank you for your honest answer. Who would approach Nathan? Okay. What would you say to Nathan? Well, I, I emphasize the good things that he did. Let's, let's, let's do it like this. Hello, Nathan. And then say it. Oh. Uh, well, thanks for, for your talk. Thank you for your talk. I'm going to repeat because of the sound. Okay. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed the part that you mentioned this and that. And, but I was a little puzzled with the way you, you, you mentioned some things that are not quite uh, part of what we, we uh, believe. But I was a little puzzled in the way that you mentioned things that are not really part of our belief system. So uh, maybe you should, we should talk more about that uh, before you, you give your next So maybe you should talk, we should talk more about that before you give the next talk. You guys like his approach? It's very good, right? So he started by complimenting Nathan and speaking about the good things that he said, right? And uh, then he gave the feedback. Now, now you're Nathan. And you have worked many hours on your lecture. <laughs> and you took time away from your family to do the lecture. And you really, really wanted to do a good job. 
and you believe that you had a very good content on your hands, how do you feel that Nate, how do you think that Nathan felt hearing the criticism? Not appreciated, okay. A little stiff, right? Hurt, perhaps? Diminished, Diminished. okay. So, I mean, we, we answer both questions. I mean, what are the, uh, uh, what are the feelings, right? So he feels uh, diminished. So should we criticize or not? Where did my water go? So one sec. Who thinks yes? Raise your hand, please. Okay, all right. You can make, yeah, it, was, it was a public meeting, right? A public meeting that day he didn't do a good lecture. But is he coming back to do it? Like, what is the purpose? I don't know, if you were the, the, the director of the center, would you invite him again? You're gonna look at the circumstances? Right. Maybe didn't explain, so you look at, uh-huh, okay. All right. Uh-huh, 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 very good. So, um, you know, some ideas are coming up here, you know. Um, just one second. Um, this is just an example. I mean, I, I couldn't create a, a, a complex scenario, you know what I mean? But it, it's like what's most important to take out of this uh, situation is that no matter how nicely you speak, the person on the other side is gonna have feelings. And one thing that we need to, to do before speaking is to understand that he will have feelings. And so it's important that we talk to each other about the feelings, you know? And, and, and you can say, I like your idea. You can say, you know what, maybe you take some responsibility. Maybe I didn't tell you exactly. Maybe it was me. Uh, this is very, you can start by saying, this is very difficult for me to say because I know how painful it is sometimes to take some criticism. But listen, don't, don't take it personally. Everybody has good and bad days. So I think that your um, words were great, but I also think that we need to seek to, 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 to understand that the person has feelings and show empathy. You know what I mean? I, I understand what you are feeling. You know, talk to me. Are you upset? When I speak to you about this, are you upset? Because to humanize the spiritual centers, we must be mindful of people's feelings. We must start talking about feelings in our dialogues. And I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about this in a minute. I'm not going to have time. This is like, OK, dealing with criticism. OK. The lack of criticism reinforced passivity, generates omission, and it's an obstacle for personal and group growth. This is says Abraga Said, OK, in his book. So you can choose not to criticize, but there are ways, like Kardec says, that you can criticize somebody, okay? We can try to be humane in the ways that we speak, understanding the person's feelings, okay? And it is precisely in this difficult dialogue, as difficult as it might be, that true friendship is built. And let me tell you something. If you can have a group of workers in your spiritual centers that truly feel that they are friends, but not only friends when we gather to raise money and party together, friends when we are able to gather to overcome the conflicts, and this is what marriage is about. Marriage gets deeper, not because of lack of conflicts, but because of the possibility of the couple to overcome the conflicts. When you overcome a conflict together, you are more united. And so the relationships in the spiritual center are gonna follow the same path. And I'm gonna tell you how to deal with conflict in a minute. So just some other few ideas. It is a contradiction to criticize without self-criticism. 
how we speak. True can be hard as a diamond or as a soft as the peach blossom. Many have learned to be sweet when criticizing but are sour when taking criticism. We become really good, we can become really good in speaking to others, in learning how to criticize others, but still, when we are the recipient of the criticism, it's a huge problem. And criticism is not only to say what's wrong, but to say what's right, right? <coughs> it is very important that we tell people how well they are doing. Very important, every day, you're doing a good job. They're not gonna be vain just because of that. You've done a really good work. It's important, we need that, it's encouragement. Now, conflicts. This is Alain Kardec again. We cannot lose sight that we're in a moment of transition, and no transition takes place without conflict. No one should be then sur surprised that certain passions will come to life <coughs> as a result of ambitions not met, wounded personal interests, and frustrated pretensions. Little by little, however, it will all come to an end, the fever will cease, men will pass, and the new ideas will prevail. Spiritists, if you want to be invincible, be benevolent and charitable. Goodness is a shield against which all the evil movement will shatter. So again, going back to the beginning, the mission is to humanize society. Jesus cannot just be this beautiful figure that we admire. We need to bring it to the heart. As difficult as it is, we need to say, let me exercise goodness. In the beginning, it's not spontaneous, but it can be done as an exercise. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this. So let's go to um, conflicts. Joana de Angelis says that conflicts constitutive of human beings and must be properly administered. They're natural. And we can manage most of them. So probably we would wish that the spiritual center didn't have any conflicts. It has. It will have for a while because we are so far from being good, right? And so we have to deal with each one's shadow every day in the work. But the good news again is that we can do something about it. So, <clears throat> um, they represent a search for alternatives. <coughs> They challenge old ideas and behaviors, they motivate change, and they help building relationships. So these are all ideas in turn around um, conflict. So please go ahead and check one, or if you, ha if you think more than one of the options uh, that apply to you on how you deal with conflicts. Go ahead and, all, really? <laughs> huh? Depends on the circumstance. Depends on the circumstance? <laughs> okay. All right, so Oh, no, I have my I have like I guess the, all those are mine. Those <laughs> waters over there. Cuz I'm at the, the very end of a code and this coffee is really bothering me. But anyway, so when you have a conflict someone who's disagreeing with you, what do you do? Do you compete until you prove the other person that you are right? And you go to the very end of it. Do you avoid, I wouldn't say anything to the speaker. You know, I better not do anything about it, right? It's gonna go away. It's gonna go, really? <laughs> really? Away where? <laughs> where? To your back muscles, so you go to the chiropractor to adjust your back the next week, right? <laughs> yeah, right, goes nowhere. So, no, I think it's better not to talk because, you know, time, time, time what? Time will make it worse because it's gonna be unresolved and then it's gonna have another conflict later on and then by the time you address it, 
it's like explosion, it's a bomb, right? Settle. Settle is when you say, well, I'm going to do what the other person wants, but deep inside you are dying. You were enraged, but you just try, you know. Um, so you can settle, you can appease, but without true resolution inside of you. Or you can cooperate. And we're going to talk about cooperation in details because it's really, um, I think, the most important thing that we're going to talk about today. Now, <coughs> take charge of your feelings in the conflict. This is something that I have um, learned with my partner. We've been together for 14 years, and it has worked for us, so I'm going to tell you what it is. Okay, so when we have a conflict, remember that little picture of the fingers pointing to one another? I have learned not to do that ever, ever. And so what I do is I say, um, you did this, and I am feeling this way, okay? So when, when that happens, it made me feel this way. So I am not judging the behavior. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm taking ownership of my own feelings. I am saying I was angry. I was, the, whatever the feeling was. I am not saying that my perception of the situation is the truth. I am just speaking, taking ownership of my own feelings. Because you know what happens? A lot of, one of the big, big problems in relationships is called assumptions. I assume that that behavior meant this, and a lot of times it meant something completely different. So when I talk about my own feelings, the other person doesn't leave the shield because I am not attacking. You can do that at the spiritual center. You can speak to one another. Let's say you had a conflict you couldn't resolve in that moment and you come back and you say to your friend, look, we had that argument and I felt this and I felt that and blah, 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 blah. And then the other person's gonna say, you know what, I felt this and this and this and this. And then, you know, you disarm yourself and each one is gonna talk about their own experience instead of talking about the other, okay? Mindfulness. Oh, I had this conflict and I felt so sad afterwards, oh, I'm so frustrated. Those words a lot of times are cover for, I'm pissed. I was raised in a, in a, in a family where um, anger, it's not a feeling that a spiritist should have. Because, you know, we are raised as spiritists and we are called to love and we are called to forgive so you don't get angry right but actually anger is a neutral feeling that just telling you there is something wrong there's nothing other than that and so the first thing is to be mindful of our own feelings and mindfulness is hot today so what is mindfulness mindfulness is when i just become aware and what do you do with that? Nothing, nothing. You become aware of the feeling. Just the fact that you become aware of it, it already helps to dissolve some. That's what mindfulness is about. So do not accuse. Remember that your perception is not the truth and the assumptions are dangerous. So with those uh, uh, hints and tips in mind, hopefully it's gonna start to get easier in the spiritual center in dealing with uh, one another. Now, another example. Okay, medium's group. One member suspects that the medium does not, everybody here knows how a medium's group runs, and yeah, everybody knows, okay. So, there is, there is a, especially in the beginning, let me go, let me, uh, go back. When, when uh, a medium incorporates and gives a message, it's never, never, ever 100% the medium always has some of the content of the medium that goes together with the message that's being 
delivered by the spirit, what's called anim, you know, a little bit of animism, your own content that goes into the message. So sometimes in the very beginning of the practice, it's gonna be 80% of your own thoughts, and then it's an intuition, 20% of the, what the mentor is there, or the spirit is there, so it's very difficult, the exercise of mediumship, especially because for the group to grow, you have to give each one's feedback. And that's why uh, the mediums group is such a hot topic in the spiritual center, and so many spiritual centers have a difficult time with it, because you actually need to work together and you need to be able to take criticism in the mediums group. And that's why Kardec also talks how important it is that is a group that has a very strong friendship, has been worked together for a long time, a long time, which that's why you must study for a while with the same group of people to create the basis. The basis, the most important factor in the mediums group, besides the knowledge, is the fraternity among the members because it's an environment where we are extremely susceptible to criticism and to dissension. And any hard feeling in the mediums group is going to affect the spiritual ambience. And that's why it's so important, and that's why people should not hurry to have mediums group. But that's, I already went out of track. Let's go back. So one member suspects that the medium does not incorporate but speaks about his own conscious content. The member gives feedback to the medium. The medium is angry. The medium reacts withdrawing. The relationship between the two stands affecting the harmony of the work. It happens a lot, okay? Whether it's in the medium's group or outside of the medium's group. All right, so two different dialogues that I'm bringing to you. One of them, the, this is the, um, the medium saying, I cannot believe that you are suspicious of me. You are suspicious of me. I am accusing you, right? And the member is going to say, but every time you speak, you repeat the same content. It is obvious that you are speaking of yourself. I think you need to be more conscious. So there's a judgment and a righteousness about what this person is talking about. Let's see another dialogue. I feel hurt by your comment. I am really trying my best and I'm feeling small and angry. So he's talking about his own feelings, right? About how he felt when he heard that. And the member's gonna say, I know that you're trying your best and this is only my perception. Let's check with the group what their perception is. No matter what, we can work on this together. We are learning and we are prone to make mistakes. So in this um, sentence, there is acknowledgement of the other's effort. There is ownership that his own perception may not be the truth. Um, and there is a spirit of cooperation. Let's work together. So it's much less threatening for the other person, right? Okay, so now <clears throat> competition versus cooperation. We're going to talk a little bit about cooperation. Cooperation is very difficult, very difficult. It's really not easy. And the reason why is when we want to cooperate with somebody else, we must accept the idea of being uncomfortable. It's much, much easier to be authoritarian. As a, as a um, president of a spiritual center, I could say, this is what we are going to do. This is how it's going to be. We're going to open this group. We're going to close this group. We are studying this today. We're doing that tomorrow. That's it. I established the rules, and that's the end of it. It's easy. Cooperation is a type of, um, of behavior that belongs to the future. We are struggling with that. We are struggling with that. We work, it's much easier to work alone than to work together. <laughs> we talk about the regeneration world. How do you think, really, that you're going to enter this world if you don't know how to work with others? 
we must learn to work with one another. It's easier to work alone. It's easier just to do whatever is in your mind. Cooperation means that you're going to listen to someone else who might disagree with you, and you have to bear the discomfort of disagreement. So it's a much higher level of skill when you can actually cooperate. Bezerra de Menezes stated, in former days, painful renunciations were demanded from the followers of the Master of Nazareth from outside to within. Now the renewing struggle takes place from the inner sanctuary outwards. We no longer have the martyrdom in the circus. The present time calls for hearts committed to the Lord in themselves. Fraternity will constitute the blessed environment of work within Christian spiritism or we will remain in the same static expectation of the beginning when the divine material of the revelation and of the truth did not find access in our unredeemable hearts. So the goal, the goal is that each spiritual center is going to have this um, environment, an environment of brotherhood. And I'm going to state this again. It's going to be much easier to deal with the conflicts if we are true friends of one another. It's much easier to forgive if you are forgiving a friend of yours. So yes, we can establish 10,000 courses in the Spiritual Center. My Spiritual Center has a course on the Spirit's Book, on the Medium's Group, on the Gospel, in Portuguese, in English, in Spanish. It's an university. But the quality of the relationships, who is paying attention to it? Whether it's in the Spiritual Center or in the Spiritual Movement, we can promote a thousand of seminars. Can we get along? Can we cooperate with one another? You have a beautiful project. Can we share? Can I help you? If I don't have the resources, maybe I can join forces with you and make your project succeed. And so those are just things for us to think about. <clears throat> I have 15 minutes, no? Okay. Rivalry distances us from Jesus' proposal and keep us in the domain of our own imperfections. Many spiritual centers would produce more if they would prioritize the quality of the relationships. The only competition that we really should get into is with our own selves. Now, cooperation. So the idea of cooperation is, in, it is an attitude that requires the courage of diminishing the self so that the group can excel and the outcomes flourish. Cooperation strengthens the individuality by negating individualism and it stimulates fraternity in detriment of selfishness. So that's one idea also that I also try to emphasize a lot. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's about making the, the words of Jesus and the gospel to prevail. If it's necessary for me to diminish myself, and a lot of times you're like, what? but I'm gonna diminish the self. What does that mean exactly, right? So that's why I put here, it's an act of humbleness. The self is connected to the divine. So when we feel truly connected to the divine, when our ego doesn't have any need for recognition, it's not about me being recognized, it's about the work being recognized. I'm not the one who is doing, you know, I'm too little, I'm too nothing. Jesus is doing through me, and it's about promoting the gospel. It's about humanizing society. We must disappear. We must move away from the spotlight. Not that we're not going to be speaking anymore or be on the camera anymore. That's not what I mean. But it's not stardom. We're not here to be stars. We're here to be little servants to a much higher cause, not my personal cause, what my agenda should be lo like. And this is important because sometimes in the spiritual center, may, even with all the difficulties that we have to give up on our point of view, you can say, but the most important thing is that the harmony of the spiritual center prevail. When you, when you read Paul and Stephen, what is the church where the, the, the phenomena of, of voices would be heard all the time? Who knows? 
one of the first churches in which city? Um, I don't even know if I know how to say in English. Antioquia. How do you say Antioquia? Antioch. Antioch. In Paul Stephen, he says that the mediumship in that church was amazing. You would hear the voice of the Spirit talking. The messages were brilliant. The reason why is because the sentiment of fraternity and simplicity among the workers of, in, in words of Emmanuel, not mine, it was the highlight. And it is precisely that that allowed for all the phenomena to take place. So he must become greater and greater, and I become less and less. <coughs> Cooperation is an exercise of humility and forgetfulness of the self. It's not about you, it's about the group and the goals. And the merit does not belong to you, it belongs to Jesus. Okay, so teamwork. So sometimes we have to be the ones crawling, right? So someone sits on us, and we shouldn't feel diminished because we are the chair. But sometimes we do. But if do my work is so little, your work is so important. Every work is important. So now, uh, to come to an end, I just brought these um, texts from Paul Stephen that is really beautiful and I think kind of um, speaks about what it's a reference for what we should seek to be as workers of the spiritist movement. <coughs> okay, so the first part, it just sets up the scenario. And I'm not going to read. I don't think I have voice left to read. I'll tell you what it is. Um, Paul was um, in prison in that moment, and he asked to be taken to Rome. He does not want to, be, um, to die in Jerusalem. So he is saying goodbye to all the people before he goes on the ship to be taken to Rome. In that moment, all the people from the city comes to say goodbye to him. Uh, James comes uh, to say goodbye to Jim, James with whom he had, had a big rivalry throughout many years. And it, it is in this scenario that Luke is with him and is observing all that. And, <coughs> and um, the children are calling him father for the first time. It's a very, very moving scene. And Luke is observing all that happening, and he's going to say to Paul, <clears throat> Few events in this world have moved me as much as this one. I will record in my notes how you were loved by all who receive from your fraternal hands the blessing of Jesus. And let's look at what Paul says. Paul, okay, he says, No, look. Do not write about virtues I do not possess. If you love me, you must not expose my name to erroneous judgments. You must speak instead of the persecutions I carried out against the followers of the Holy Gospel, of the grace the Master shed on me at the gates of Damascus, so that the most hardened person do not despair of salvation, but await his mercy at the right moment. You shall speak of our encounters, encounters with powerful and learned men, of our work with the unfortunate, so that the followers of the Gospel in the future do not fear the most difficult and trying situations aware that the messengers of the Master will always watch over them when they become true instruments of fraternity and love along the pathways that unfold for the evolution of humankind. However, keep silent about the endeavor because the garland, the reward, belongs to Jesus alone. It was He who lifted us of our anguish, anguishing misery to fill out, to fill out our emptiness. It was his hand that charitably took us and redirected us to the holy way. No matter how much we have studied, we still feel an abyss between us and the wisdom of eternity. No matter how hard we have worked, we are not worthy of him who has watched over and guided us since the first instant of our lives. We have nothing of our own. The Lord fills the emptiness of our soul and does the good that we do not possess. 
this is very serious. Because whether it's in the spiritual center or in the spiritual movement, we see nowadays, and that's a little Sikhika Fili who says, many, many spiritists putting themselves on the spotlight in the work of self-promotion. When Paul of Tarsus said that he was nothing, he wasn't worthy of him. So his words, we have nothing of our own. The little bit that we do, we do it because Jesus helps us, because the spirits are next to us. So we must have no illusions of grandiosity. In every single work and every single thing that we do, we should give Jesus the credit for it. And we should seek this mindset when we are working in the spiritual center. When the trembling elderly embraces us in tears, when the children kisses us in tenderness, they did it to Christ. We get the compliments and we feel so good about themselves when people are complimenting us. It becomes about us, but it should always be about the Christ. The little bit that I do, I do because of his mercifulness. The little bit that I do, I do because of his goodness. It's about him. So we have this illusion. Oh, I, you know, I'm a great speaker. I'm a great president. I'm, I'm great, great nothing. Nothing. Because if Paul was nothing, who do you think you are? Right? James and his companions. But this, I'm, this is not in a negative way. Okay? Don't, I don't want anyone to take my words wrongly. We are divine beings. We are beautiful beings, but we just have to express our beauty from the essence of who we are and not from the ego. Have you ever, ever seen Chico Xavier talking about himself, about his own goodness, about the amazing mediumship that he had? No, never, ever. Because when you are in line with love and God, there is no self-promotion. In that sense, Facebook is a very, um, uh, serious, um, you know, thing in our lives, because it is, as I say, the you know, the the window for the ego that can really uh, express itself. Um, so James and his companions did not come from Jerusalem only to demonstrate their loving fraternity. They came to bear witness of their love for the Master, who has united us in the same vibration of sacred sentient solidarity, although. They are unable to express the hidden mechanism of such glorious and sublime emotions. In the midst of all this, look, we are only poor servants who have taken advantage of the Lord's possessions to pay our own debts. He has bestowed mercy upon us, upon us so that justice may be done. The joys and divine emotions belong to him. Therefore, let us not have the least concern about relating episodes that would leave a door open to vanity. Therefore, let us not have the least concern about relating episodes that would leave a door open to vanity. Read that several times after you leave here. I will. It is enough for us to have the profound conviction that we have paid our claimer's debts. So we should this, seek this mindset and this awareness. The time is almost over, so um, you have the handbooks. Um, you can go back to it and uh, write with your own words what the gist of this message is for you, and each person would probably write a little different what uh, it meant to you. Um, there was a lot more to talk about, but I figured I would talk what was um, uh, what the time would fit and just so you know there is a little bit about leadership here and um, I really really love this concept of leadership being horizontal it's not vertical so horizontal leadership means cooperation means listening to others means not taking decisions on your own but checking with the group and all decisions in this outside of administrative decisions all other decisions should have at least two people cooperating. So because a lot of times we are so imperfect in our thinking that you know it's better if you are cooperating with someone if you want to keep the quality of the work. So <clears throat> you can use again the material 
write what um, horizontal leadership would mean. We also brought here the concept of empathy. So you can go through this. This is pr pretty self-explanatory. You can look at you know um, what kind of um, which one of these um, characteristics the leaders of your group have, or you as a leader have. In here, there is, and you can read on your own time because I'm going to respect the time. Um, there is a final message uh, from Dr. Bezerra de Menezes that I translated from this book, Bezerra de Menezes. Um, what's the name in Portuguese? Yesterday and today. Bezerra de Menezes, yesterday and um, today. So we have two minutes, so I just want to know if anybody wants to say anything ask any questions or anything? <coughs> wow, you're so quiet. <laughs> How come? No one has conflicts at the spiritual center? I must go visit your spiritual center. No? Okay. That's a lot of, a lot of stuff to think about, right? Take, take the booklet to your groups and do with your group of workers. You know, some of those uh, exercises, um, it can be a very good um, practice and a, a very good uh, team building experience with, um, with your group. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>